Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Vegan Spirituality Online Gathering. My name is Lisa Levinson, and I am the founder of Vegan Spirituality. I am campaigns director for In Defense of Animals. And it is my pleasure to host this online gathering. And our intention is to explore veganism as a spiritual practice. And we do this together online, but we also have in-person meetings. And if you'd like to gather in person, you can go to veganspirituality.com and find a group near you. Um, we have groups in Los Angeles and Philadelphia and uh, Phoenix, Tucson, lots of places. So we'd love to welcome you in person as well. So I also have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, my co-host for today, who is uh, Reverend Carol Saunders. She's a dear friend and she is um, sitting in for Judy Carmen. and uh, Carol runs the Spiritual Forum. So we're very, very happy that she's here. Hi, Carol. Hi, Lisa. I'm really happy to be here. And I know I'm filling big shoes with Judy not being here. So I hope I hope everyone's happy. Yes, we are so happy that you're here. Um, and then you have a very special guest to introduce as well. Yes, yes. So uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Alyssa Haransky-Beck. She's been practicing functional behavioral developmental optometry, specializing in vision and movement therapy since she graduated from the Pennsylvania College of Optometry in 1987. She's a fellow in the College of Optometrists and Vision Development and a member of the American Optometric Association and the Pennsylvania Optometric Association. She holds an MA in Spiritual Nutrition vegan and live food nutrition from the University of Integrated Science in California. And she has certificates in expanding culinary joy, mastering rainbow, green live food cuisine, and the conscious eating program from the Dr. Cousins Tree of Life Center, U.S. Vegan Live Food Trainings. She's also attended um, the Incredible Life Transformation Program at the Hippocrates Health Institute in 2012. And her exciting new book is entitled Enlivening Consciousness, Deepening Our Journey Through Vision, Movement, Nutrition, Nature, and Spirit. It takes us on a journey to improve our health and wellness through vision, movement, nutrition, nature, and spirit. Something I know we're all interested in. Welcome, Alyssa. It's great to have you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Reverend Carol. It's nice to nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, we were chatting a little bit before we got the push the record button and we were just meeting for the first time. But we've got a lot of great questions for you. We want to learn a lot about you. And I know that everybody's going to to really benefit from this hour we have with you. And I would like for you to start by sharing your vegan journey and what inspired you to go vegan. Ah, uh, the vegan journey. So that's the question I was asked when Joanne Kong was compiling her vegan voices book. And I was the only one who didn't answer the question. I wrote a poem instead. So, but but in a, in a nutshell, um, my vegan journey began in 2012, in 2012, when I landed at the Hippocrates Health Institute. Um, I had already been an optometrist for uh, a long time. I graduated from optometry school in 1987. And I thought I knew something about health and wellness. Uh, but I landed at the Hippocrates Health Institute, which is now Hippocrates Wellness, um, in, in 2012. And I, I went from becoming a carnist to becoming a raw living foodist in three weeks. And um, I started mailing seeds back to my husband and saying, we have to start sprouting, you know. And so it was a huge, um, impactful time in my life because in those three weeks, I learned more about um, health and wellness than I had learned up to that point in my lifetime. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate now about sharing um, the relationship between health and wellness and veganism and spirituality because it, it all to me is one at this point. And I'm not um, 
I'm, I'm, I, when I came out of Hippocrates wellness, you know, all those years ago, I was an evangelist and I thought everybody should become a raw living foodist. I'm not that intense about it anymore because I realize that everybody is on their own journey. Everybody is on their own journey. And it's not really my role, at least in this physical form, in this lifetime, to change anybody's idea about who they are. But I am going to be continuing to work with myself on myself and then model what I can. And that's 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 it in a nutshell. <laughs> I could give you a lot more details for the rest of the time, but maybe you have another question for me. Well, and we'll have a Q and A after this. But it is it is always interesting to hear people's journey, and it sounded like the switch was pretty fast for you. That it was pretty automatic, and then getting to this place where you're not trying to evangelize. I think that's something many of us struggle with. When do we speak, and when do we not? And it sounds like you found a really good balance for that, allowing people to be where they are um, and, and not trying to evangelize anymore. <laughs> I think we can yeah, learn a lot I, from that. <laughs> I, I think that that's really important because I have a tendency to overdo and over offer. And I often have had the experience in my life um, pretty recently, uh, in fact, that um, I, I unintentionally chase people away with the intensity of my sensibilities. And, um, you know, <laughs> my core family has probably been my best training ground. I know, I know my husband is here somewhere. I just noticed, you know, in the participant list, but, and our daughter, at least one of them is here listening, but they help, they have helped me to balance my sensibilities so that I'm not too extreme, right? Because the fact of the matter is that, and I love raw living foodism. I, I love eating organic food. I love sprouting. But as I'm, when I travel, it's really not so easy. And, and um, I do the best I can. Right now, I'm working on um, preparing for uh, a, tr a trip to San Francisco. And um, I'm going to be speaking at a professional conference. And I, I asked, well, vegan is now an option you know, on, on the menu choice. But I, so I took it another step further and I said, you know, I'm going to be speaking. I really want to be well prepared and I need vegan organic. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm in conversation now with um, the hotel through the organizer of the conference. It's in San Francisco. So if any place in the world is going to do vegan organic in a public place, why not in San Francisco? And what I learned is that they do organic food. Some of their food is organic, but they can't guarantee it all. And that we can check, I can check back the week of. And so I thought, that's great. They got back to me. You know, they're willing to um, entertain the idea. And, um, and so I was pretty happy about that. 10 years ago, I wouldn't have done that. You know, I would just be happy to have some vegetables on a plate. And if they were cooked, okay, I need to eat something. You know, I'm though I'm pretty thin to begin with. I have to eat, but but this year, what I'll do is I will make sure I'll make it a point if they don't have organic, I'll be bringing my own food. And so then I asked for permission to bring my own food rather than trying to dictate, hey, you need to have healthy organic food. I don't want vegan junk food, you know. And I've gotten really criticized for these kinds of sensibilities within the vegan world, but more so in the mainstream world. You know, stop pushing your veganism on people. Okay, okay, you're not the one who I'm going to be talking to about yeah. it, but I didn't mean it. I just, it just came out of my mouth, you know? <laughs> and I might be offending perhaps some people on this call, you know, because this is vegan spirituality. Our vegan spirituality a Southwestern PA group, which I founded in, Lisa might have to help me out with this. This was 2019, I think, after I got my master's in spiritual nutrition. We always model healthy vegan organic food because in my view, and maybe this is another question, I didn't really study the questions you're going to ask me, but, um, and, and thank you, Lisa, uh, Judy Carmen, for supplying the questions, but I didn't have a chance to look at them. Um, 
when we're moving deeply into our soma, into our bodies, into our breath, and into our spiritual natures, we must feed our vessels things that our bodies understand. And so if we think back to you know, us as hunters or gatherers or just beings that were so much more connected with the earth, then what are we going to eat? You know, we're not gonna eat, I don't know, I don't even know if Fritos are vegan at this point, but we're not gonna eat Fritos and Gatorade um, to, to supply our body with the energy and the biodynamic nature of what we are truly meant to be. And so I am pretty opinionated about this. And you can ask me the deepest questions in this forum as you want, because I will answer them completely honestly about how I feel, how strongly I feel, not only about organic, but about veganic. You know, what about growing food in a way that doesn't have animal inputs, you know, other than the natural things like if, if a deer is running by and poops, you know, okay, they eat plants anyway. So, you know, let their poop <laughs> be on my food or well, I'm gonna wash it off anyway. But there's there's so much to think about even as a vegan, you know, and, and even if you're not a vegan activist, if you're vegan, you're an activist because you walk into a room and you either have your own food with you or you're asking about specifics on the menu. And so just the act of being vegan is a spiritual act in my view. Mm, I love that. I also really love the term sensibilities. That's a really, that's a good take home word for all of us, I think today. I, I think we'd like to know about your, you've kind of shared your perspective on health, uh, but we're really curious about how vision plays a part of this. Yeah, so um, this, question may be coming later to me, but I'm going to introduce the whole thing in the answer about vision. So I am an eye doctor, you know, I'm a professional eye doctor, and I've been in practice since 1987. And I had a very conventional medical training. Um, you know, I had a conventional science training, four years of undergraduate. Um, my, my degree was in biology with an emphasis in ecology. And then at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, I got a degree in visual science, and that was another four-year degree, doctor of optometry. Um, the reason I wrote my book, and this is what I mean about telling the whole story. So my, this is my book. I'm very proud of it. It just came out in February of 2024. There's some glare here, but it's called Enlivening Consciousness, Deepening Your Journey Through Vision, Movement, Nutrition, Nature, and Spirit. And the idea is that it's a book in five parts. And so I'm an eye doctor. So you'll learn in the first part of the book about vision. You'll learn first about eyesight, right? You know, if you've ever had an eye exam, you go sit in the eye doctor's office and they start, they ask you some questions about what you're doing there. Um, is it a general check or, or do you have an eye health issue? And then they start flipping lenses in front of you, which is better, one or two. I have a little comment about that question, which is better one or two, because our endpoint in, in optometric testing is often equal blur. <laughs> equal blur is the endpoint. We, we're looking for equal blur. And then once it's equally blurry, that number one and that number two, then we move on to the next test, right? Or the next part of the test. What is that all about? these just noticeable differences. So the question that begs to be asked is what is vision? What is eyesight? I write about the conventional stuff in the first part, the first chapter of the book or the second chapter. And then after the introduction, and then I start to get into what is holistic vision care and what does that mean? Most of us have never thought about the idea that our eyesight can be improved and that we are the prime movers and shakers in that natural eyesight improvement. We go to the eye doctor, we get an eyeglass prescription, either for distance vision so we can drive at night or during the day, or for near vision so we can see our book to read our book. Okay, if you need glasses right now to read my book, I give you permission <laughs> to use your eyeglasses for now. 
But if you want to improve your eyesight so you don't need those reading glasses or those distance lenses, this is not only a possibility, but it's, it's a probability if you're willing to explore the notion. And this is not something that we were taught in school. Um, you mentioned that I um, am a fellow in the College of Optometrists and Vision Development. This is a very special group of optometrists um, also the Neuro-Optometric Rehabilitation Association, a couple of very special groups of optometrists that really are into exploring improvement. I've taken it in, uh, even a step further because I've started to integrate movement, not started, this has been my practice for decades, but I'm also a somatic movement therapist and embody vision yoga teacher. Um, and, and I have integrated the reflexes that underlie vision development or redevelopment in many people's cases, especially in our computer world and in our device world where we're often hunched over in what I call a myopic or nearsighted posture with our shoulders hunched and our eyeballs hunched <laughs> and everything, all our muscles tight. You know, we're not out there climbing through trees or walking very much or jumping or jumping on the trampoline or we might be in a gym in an enclosed space outside of daylight or moonlight. We might think we're doing what's good, you know, and all of those things are good. Don't get me wrong, but what is vision? I keep coming back to that question. What is vision? How is it based in movement? And then the third section of my book is nutrition, right? So what do you think the nutrition section might be about? <laughs> nutrition, this is the nutrition section. Okay, nutrition, um, integrating our vision by moving into self-care through diet. Move at your own pace. I'm reading right from the, um, you know, the bullet page, right at the beginning of the nutrition section. Move at your own pace while considering moving into or toward a plant-based or vegan lifestyle, and ultimately the raw living foods lifestyle, I put that in parentheses, I couldn't resist, for resetting your taste buds, detoxifying and building immunity. And what else is in the nutrition chapters? Becoming a plant-based eater, vegan curious, vegan leaning or vegan to raise your vibrations, right? So I'm not saying go become a vegan tomorrow like I did in 2012. I'm saying put one more vegetable on your plate and maybe take some of the little bit of the cow and put it, you know, just don't cook as much cow. Don't cook as many fishes, you know? Um, and I have suggested recipe ideas in here. And then I say, and they're not all raw ve vegan living foodists. I have a, a variety. I don't have vegan junk food in here, but I have some pretty delicious recipes. There's not many, but there's, there's some good ones. And I say your curiosity is paramount to behavioral change. So I'm sometimes called a behavioral or functional or developmental optometrist, meaning that I meet you preferably exactly where you are in your journey and you may be way far ahead of me in your vegan journey, but I bet you're not ahead of me in natural eyesight improvement. And I'm not perfect. You know, I still wear glasses to drive at night and I have my pinhole glasses here right with me um, to put on when I'm looking at the computer and I need to see something very fine that I can't quite make out. But my point is we're all, we're all at some point in our journey. And, and we're right where we're supposed to be. So I don't know if I answered your question, but what does veganism have to do with spirituality? As we keep our vessel clear, God, spirit, source, however you talk about it or define it, begins to work through us, through you, through you, rather than you having to go after whatever it is you think the answer is because the answer is right here. And the more clear that your vessel is, the more life just unfolds easily. And people come to you with what they need 
and and what you need just like starts to fall into your lap synchronistically. I'm I'm here to tell you that that's how it's worked for me, and I know it's worked for gazillions of people once they get out of their own way. And to me, vision is all about the external vision that we talk about when we go to a, an eye doctor, and it's about inner vision and the integration of vision and movement and spirit and what we eat and what we think and, and, and nature connecting, you know, connecting to not just outer nature, not just the trees, but ourself as a tree, ourself as this biodynamic, energetic, beautiful, incredible, unique being that you are, that we all are. And life then becomes exciting. And I tell people often, I don't drink, I don't smoke, my husband gives me a hard time. I say, I'm high on life because there's so much excitement. Like I teach people how to access the drugs in their own brain. And a side effect is that their vision improves naturally, you know, and veganism is a huge part of it, you know, but, but I'm not pushing it. In, at least I don't think I am in the way that I used to. Cause I used to say, look, like, are you kidding me? What are you eating? no you know, some of our family cooks meat in our house where I live, okay? Are you gonna judge me because of that? You can if you want, but that's my reality. I'm not gonna kick, you know, people out of my house because they they wanna eat in a different way than I do, you know, especially if they weren't raised that way. I wasn't raised that way. I ate everything. I mean, I was always a healthy eater, I thought. Talk to Michael Greger about that if you wanna know about meat and health, right? I always thought I ate a healthy diet and I've always been within my weight range or on the thin edge of things, but what was I eating? <laughs> what energy was I eating? I was eating the energy of, of, of death, you know, and I don't want to do that anymore. Well, that's really, really interesting. I think this whole, <laughs> this whole path with vision is fascinating as it integrates with veganism and and spirituality. I'm kind of interested in how you became interested in functional optometry. And can you share some of the results that some of your clients, I'm assuming you call them clients or patients, whatever you call them, the, the people who come to you, uh, what kind of results have you seen in, in their lives? And then uh, in addition to that, I'm really curious in your practice, if you experience any kind of resistance towards the, the vegan message that you're not pushing on people, but you're certainly suggesting. So I'll ask, I'll answer the second question first, and then I may ask you to repeat the first question, but um, <laughs> in terms of resistance, um, I have not really found resistance uh, when I'm seeing people one-on-one -on -one for a consultation, I might call them, you know, in, in, in the old days, everybody was a patient, but now their patients or clients, depending on how they're coming to me through, through for, and, and, and what they're interested in, in doing, um, in, in collaborating with, with, uh, with me on. But the resistance for me has come more in my volunteer work, like through Vegan Spirituality, um, Southwest PA, uh, where I've been, where Vegan Spirituality, Southwest PA has been a collaborative um, you know, nonprofit entity in, in a group of environmentalists, for example. This is my most recent example of, of resistance. And I won't use any specifics, but if you look at me and you examine me on the internet, you might be able to figure it out what this story is that I'm telling, um, where I always created a vegan, a healthy vegan food, not just choice, but that was the only choice when we would have an events that have to do with environmental um, things. And um, I got pushback and real resistance because the environmentalists that I was working with really didn't understand the connection between why, and I think a lot of vegan people that, are, that call themselves vegan don't understand the connection. So I'm here to, to announce it. <laughs> <laughs> right now that if you're eating vegan junk food that you, you you ought to just pay attention you know oreos are vegan now but but is that helping you to rise to your highest potential 
but I have to also admit I, my, my main addiction is sugar. You know, I'm a little bit of a chocolate junkie sometimes, you know, it's good chocolate, you know, sometimes it's cacao nibs and there's a lot of maple syrup in there. That's probably too much sugar for me, you know, for me, but it, but, but, but is it vegan junk food, cacao nibs and chia pudding with maple syrup? No, not, you know, most people wouldn't call that vegan junk food. But but my point is, I put this food out in the environmental um, sector and they're like, no, no, we want our, you know, cream in our coffee. And I'm like, well, we don't even have coffee. Well, you know, a couple of years ago, some of the environmentalists, they had to go get some coffee because there was no coffee. How can you have a meeting without coffee? And then that coffee has to have milk in it. It can't have soy milk or oat milk or almond milk. Or, I mean, imagine the coffee. I drink coffee every once in a blue moon, but coffee with freshly made almond milk frothed up on top. You tell me what tastes better. I remember what milk tastes like. And <laughs> it, you can't even compare because freshly prepared almond milk is delightful and sprinkle some cinnamon in there and you're in heaven on earth, you know? So if you're not vegan, just give it, just, just try it, try it one time. You might like it, you know, in the old days, you didn't have these choices. We have so many choices, but unfortunately a lot of vegan junk food choices are, are, are there. So that's the resistance story. And then what was your other question? How did you get interested in functional optometry and what are some of the results that you had with your, your clients or patients, whatever you call them, in terms of improving their vision naturally? I, I have a couple of testimonials on my website, enliveningconsciousness.com, that are fun. One is, is written and the other is just a woman that I worked with literally with herself and her daughter, her child. Now I can't remember if it was a boy or a girl, I'm embarrassed to say, but um, it was just at a festival. And I, I noticed some movement patterns in this baby. And I, I was just talking to her, it was raining that day and we were sitting under a tent and I just was playing literally in a developmental movement way with this child very briefly because the, I can't remember the exact story. I have to go watch my video again, that's on my own website, but it was something, and this is very common in children and babies. Um, people don't want to let their children be on their bellies on the earth in their first year of life. They're afraid of sudden in, infant death syndrome. And so as a result, children are on their backs and they're, what, what, what happens then is that they're, they're more likely to be startled, right? This is the startle reflex. And, and um, they're not able to connect with the earth on their bellies as much as we have the potential for connecting in that first year of life. And um, so I was watching this child and the mom was saying something like, you know, something about the crawling or the child wasn't really crawling, but the, the child was trying to stand up. And um, if you listen to the testimonial, it's really delightful. I worked with the child very briefly. And then the next week, I think the, 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 the mom, mom came back with her baby and she was like gushing. I said, could I video you here? Because people don't necessarily understand that the way that children are allowed to be in their first year of life has everything to do with their visual development later in life. Um, and so I've always been into movement. I, I was professionally trained in ballet. I wanted to become a ballerina. But as time went on, I started to have some physical somatic issues. And it was at the same time I was in optometry school and I recognized somehow intuitively, I don't know, I came onto the planet this way, um, that there's a connection between, um, between vision and movement. And so I sought that out while I was in optometry school. Um, I mean, most of optometry school was very technical, very academic, but our final year, our fourth year was clinical. And so I sought out rotations through pediatrics and, um, working with optometrists in different places that spend a lot of time with children and also with it, with children and adults that have learning related visual issues and also post-traumatic brain injury and um, just rehabilitation um, on, on many dimensions, uh, you know, PTSD, uh, you know, 
and on and on. Because the way I recognize that in optometry school, my colleagues, my now colleagues could study much less than me. I mean, I always did very well in school, but when I got to optometry school, it was hard for me. I wasn't as prepared academically. I had taken dance, some dance classes in college and undergrad. I hadn't taken necessarily as many science classes as others. And I wasn't as prepared and I got slammed my first year of optometry school. And I couldn't sit in my chair in the same way that the other people could. And they were going skiing on the weekend and I was studying. I was dancing around my studio apartment so that I could you know, express myself. I was dancing and learning the names of the, you know, the cells, or I was, you know, I was doing things differently. And so I recognized that there's a relationship between how we act in the world, how we behave and our vision. And there was a, um, a man named um, Robert Kraskin, may he rest in peace, and Paul Lewis, may they both rest in peace, who were mentors of mine, and Harry Wax. Uh, Robert Kraskin and, and Paul Lewis came to our optometry school one weekend early in my optometric career. And they were talking all about developmental functional behavioral optometry. And I thought, who are these men? And are you kidding me? I haven't learned any of this. I've learned about people that have crossed eyes and how to help them uncross their eyes. I've learned about people that have one eye looking out the door and the other eye looking at me and how to work with them. I've learned about referring for surgery for those kinds of cases, but these men were talking about functional ways to help these people straighten out their visual system without surgery, without drugs, you know? And even to this day in my profession, surgery is accepted and drugs are accepted as, as okay. And it's not okay with me. If it's okay with me, if that's what you want, but if that's what you want, then I'm not your doctor. I'm not your therapist. I'm not your, I'm not your person. I'm, I'm for you. If you are really into one time we had a visitor at our house and they're like, you've got a lot of self-help books around here. <laughs> they're all nonfiction and they're all like, how do you improve you? How do you improve this? How do you improve that? How do you improve? Yes, if you're into that sort of thing and you're just passionate and you've been working to try to improve this, that, or the other, but you haven't been getting anywhere and you've gone to every specialist, these are the people that I've worked with for my whole career. Now, if you're too complicated, I don't know if I wanna work with you anymore, but as I'm saying that tongue in cheek because it turns out that I might look normal, you know, but when you look really, inside of me and you examine me, you're gonna see that there's things that you can't see that I've been working with for my entire life and I'm not done yet, as long as I'm in this physical form. If, if, if that resonates with you, then I would love to work with you. I'd be delighted to work with you and guess what? I don't necessarily even have to work with you very much. You might work with me for one hour on Zoom or on the phone, and you might have enough material to work with for the next year. Casually, gently, in your activities of daily living. And, you know, you know, I can offer you something as simple as, you know, I've been sitting here for now um, about 39 minutes or 49 minutes, because we got here early in front of my computer screen. So we're presumably some of us in front of computer screens, or in front of devices, take a moment. You know, you can see me moving, but rock to one of your sit bones, come back to your center, rock to your other sit bone. If you don't know what your sit bone is, it's the bone at the bottom of your bottom, right? You could even, if nobody's looking, put your hands down there so you can really feel your sit bone. I'm rocking to my right sit bone. I'm coming back to my somatic center. I'm rocking to my left. I'm coming back to my center. I'm feeling my feet on the floor supporting me. And I'm feeling the energy of Mother Earth coming through the soles of my feet, through my ankles, through my shins, through my knees and thighs. I'm feeling the energy rising up through my pelvis and torso, 
through my fingers, through my elbows and shoulders, through all the organs inside of me, through my heart cradled by my lungs. I'm feeling the energy rise up through my neck, through my face, and my eyelids are closed now. I don't know about you. I'm feeling the earth energy from below. I'm feeling the energy of the sky coming through my crown, coming from the base of my spinal cord up through my visual system that is starting from the eyes in the back of my head all the way through the middle of my skull, out into my eyeballs, my cornea, the front of my eyes, my eyelids, my eyelashes. Oh, you know, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> we're all feeling really relaxed i guess i guess the question i have is i've had corrective lenses since my 20s and can i reverse that is that something that i can naturally reverse i know people have done it but i don't know how so is that something that we can all hope for or, or plan for absolutely yeah absolutely and you just had your first lesson so if yeah. you remember even one thing that I just said when I was doing that progressive relaxation, just one thing, bring it to your mind, your conscious mind once a day, and then take time if you're podcasting in front of a computer to gaze through the computer screen. And if you don't know how to do that, I can teach you something about that. But if you can't do that, and that seems stressful, trace the the rim or the periphery of your computer screen. You might want to extend your finger to do that. You might do it quickly. You might do it really, really slowly and follow your fingertip and track slowly across. You know, there's just so much that you can integrate into your activities of daily living that will help you improve and move back more into the relaxing part of your nervous system. Um, and I get real specific when it comes, you know, when people come to me specifically for their particular issue. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. As long as you're alive and you're still breathing. Um, yeah. And, you know, now I'm starting to wonder if we're talking about spirituality. I'm starting to wonder about uh, I think that that's what we're here for, first of all, to improve our our physical form. But maybe if we don't complete our journey in physical form, you know, there's, there's, there's spirits or entities or whatever you want to call them floating around that are still, they're, they're right here with us in this conversation. They're like, how come nobody told me about that when I was in physical form? <laughs> and they're like, I'm feeling like there's a lot of energy around here right now. It's like, you go girl, you know, go for this. But, but I have threaded throughout my book, um, just, you know, uh, there's pages, a couple of them in the book that say, breathe, blink, bring your blinking to conscious awareness and be present. And, and I'm not going to give you a formulaic breath pattern in my book. I can when I'm working with you privately, if you want that, and that makes you feel good, but just bring your breath to conscious awareness, you know, breathe, breathe. And blink, bring your blinking to conscious awareness because we tend to stare at computer screens or at people or at TVs or at <laughs> the movies, you know. But when you bring your blinking, your 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 you know, your your muscles around your eyes, you know, theoretically your blinking is unconscious or subconscious, but we tend to stare. So we create poor habits, poor visual habits. So how do we then bring these habits to conscious awareness? So I noticed, Reverend Carol, that you're blinking. You just took a little minute to think about that and you were blinking a little bit more than I had seen you blink for the past 40 minutes, right? And then when you blink more, you might be breathing more, right? And then you might be more able to access your spiritual nature for that millisecond. Maybe, maybe as a suggestion. And then you're coming more into your own presence. So throughout the book, I've threaded poetry. I've threaded prose. It's a little bit autobiographical, but I, I was really drawn to write this book, which is really five books in one, 
um, I told my editor, I'm not writing five books, I'm writing one book, to understand the interrelationship between all of these different pieces of who we are. I am not just an eye doctor. You are not just an interviewer. I am not just a yoga teacher. You are not just a reverend. I am not just, you are not just. And whoever's watching here now live or later, you are not just what you think you are or what other people have projected upon you. I am not, I am hearing raindrops right now and I'm gonna pull my window closed. Just hold on one second here so that the um, raindrops don't come inside my house. I'm not gonna run down the hall and close the other windows. The raindrops will go onto those windows <laughs> and I'll dry those raindrops later. But um, we, we have so much potential inside of us that it's just incredible. And I wanna mention one more thing. I don't know if you have more questions, but I am doing a virtual book launch. And for those who are watching live, who are either watching on Facebook or Zoom, if you would like to participate in my live Zoom book launch, it's going to be an hour long on um, Wednesday, March 20th, which is this coming Wednesday from 3 p.m. until 4 p.m. Eastern. And the way that you can get that Zoom link is to go to my website. Uh, maybe somebody who's on, who's here on the chat can write my website in the chat it, and if they know how to spell it. <laughs> it's enliveningconsciousness.com. So it's E-N-L-I-V-E-N-I-N-G. Consciousness, no spaces, but the next word is consciousness, C-O-N-S-C-I-O-U-S-N-E-S-S.com forward slash book or forward slash blog. But if you go forward slash book or you look at the bottom of any of my website pages, put your name on my email list. I do not email very much. You will get a few emails between now and March 20th and maybe a thank you email once I compose it and get it into the queue. But um, I, I will just email for very special events. And this is a very special event. It is my book. It is I'm totally biased. I surrender to my bias. I love my book. I, I, ca I can't even believe it. I worked on it for many years. It is a life work. And I think that even if you don't want to hire me for my services, which I completely understand, read my book or listen to my book once it comes out in audio or read the book into a tape recorder and listen to it again and again, because you will pick up gems of natural eyesight improvement even before you would ever see me. I can help you fine tune it, but this is a great start. And I was so drawn to write the book because I know that most people don't talk about this information in an integrated fashion. And I'm passionate about cross-pollinating, cross-pollinating vegan junk fooders with vegan live foodists, cross-pollinating environmentalists with people that are into health and wellness so that they can understand that it's really the same thing and you can't really do one without the other because we are at a critical moment on planet earth and we're be being given so much attention and opportunity, but we have to take care of our part of the bargain and our part of the bargain, especially if you're vegan, is to take even better care of yourself so that you can share the information even more effectively and efficiently. Alyssa, you've given us so much <laughs> to digest and take into. And I just love the idea of functional medicine. I just love how it, it I just love it. I hope it spreads like wildfire in all medical uh, professions. Um, Lisa, I think we, we may want to turn over for Q&A. Do you want to take it over from here? Yes. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> I, uh, first want to just mention that this was such an interesting discussion. I love the experiential part of the blinking and really tuning into what's happening physically and how that translates into our spiritual um, vision. Do you I know think? what? This is really crazy, but I'm just looking at the chat now. 
And it looks like we had a Zoom bomber. And so I just want to say something to that Zoom bomber, which has probably been ejected by now. But it's really interesting to me because I can feel the anger of the person who probably wrote that in there. And just imagine for somebody like me, um, I was a fractivist. If you don't know what fracking is, just look it up. But I was a fractivist for about a decade. And I still live here in southwestern Pennsylvania where fracking is active. So the land underneath me has been deeply raped, deeply, and it continues to be raped. And as we eat flesh, dead flesh, we're contributing to rape. And so it's just really obvious to me that whoever this angry person was who wrote this obscenity in there, that, that it's, it's, it's not that person's fault. It's the fault of all of us, no matter who we are, no matter how pure we think we are, we still have something to work on. And we are no different than this person that came in to offer their obscenity, their anger, their disgust with what's going on. Because we really have all the responsibility. And this person came in just so I could, um, so I could make that comment because it's really the truth of, um, I don't know if the chat was was turned off after that because of that comment, but I hope that people could ask comment, um, ask questions if they wanted to. Yes, we do have a question for you. So uh, this question is from Joyce who says, I've been vegan for seven years, I'm vegetarian for 40 years, and just started watching Marcus and Karen's videos and starting to eat more raw. Do you think it would be good to change slowly so the detox will be less intense? So I think that's a very personal question. Um, for example, I personally went from carnist to raw living foodist in three weeks and I felt so good, but I was totally supported. I was given green juices that were prepared for me three times a day, celery, cucumber, sprouts, you know, I was given salad. I was given, um, I was riding my bicycle around the campus. I, we had, uh, you know, there was like psychological stuff going on where they were, we were, it was talk therapy for the whole group. I mean, if you feel supported and you feel comfortable in how you're stepping into eating more raw, then keep going with it. If you notice you're starting to feel sick some way because you're going too fast, um, then back up a little bit. But the bottom line is, if you're starting to introduce raw living organic foods, um, I just don't see how you can go wrong. Just keep eating a normal volume. Make sure you're eating the volume of food. You have to work with yourself. And I mean, I would be happy to help you along the journey. And there's lots of people around the world that would be happy to help you if you need support along the way. There are, you know, there's Facebook groups. There's all, there's all kinds of ways that you can get support. So because you've asked the question, I might suggest that you start to look around for some of these things. And don't you don't have to go at it alone. That's old fashioned. <laughs> call in, call in support, you know. Thank you. And then we have um, maybe another question. Uh, this one's from Chris, who asks if you are in the Pittsburgh area. I am. Who, what, what, who, what's Chris, who, who Chris, who? I know some Chris's. <laughs> well, Chris is in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're in the Pittsburgh. I'm in the Pittsburgh area. Thank you. And then if anyone else has any other questions, you're welcome to type them into the Q&A. Yeah, it, it just mentions uh, in the Q&A, since you were forced to disable the chat, perhaps you could. Yes, mention... I know. I've, I've yeah. posted that one. So. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to entertain other questions. You can always reach me through my website, um, which is enliveningconsciousness.com. And um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Lisa Levinson is the one who said to me, I, I, I forget exactly about our first conversation, but I remember it was that first conversation. I'm pretty sure where once you connect, once we connected, you said, oh, 
I asked her about starting a, a chapter of vegan spirituality. She's like, oh yeah, you can do that. And she, then she starts sending me the literature. So just whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're interested in starting a chapter, just be careful because once you have that conversation with Lisa, she's going to put you on the map. And it's been just a pleasure to facilitate this group because we've, we, you know, we've been to different churches and synagogues and friends meeting houses and We've done all kinds of creative things and you're just a beautiful, gentle mentor. And um, Reverend Carol, thank you. I, I, we have to get to know each other some more and I hope to go to, wait, what is it? The spiritual forum. I've heard about such great things. I've never been there, but I'm excited. Um, yeah, Judy, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's just a podcast prayer and retreat ministry and I have an annual oh. retreat and yeah. Oh, okay. So. Well, there's something else that vegan spirituality does in person once a year. It's called, what is it called? Oh, that is actually Carol has been hosting. Yeah, it is. It is an in-person retreat. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. 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 Well, you should come. <laughs> Yes, we invite everyone to join us. It's spiritualforum.org slash retreat. Lots of information there. And it's it's an interesting place because it's a it's a real intersection of veganism and spirituality. Anybody who is concerned or loves the planet and the world and people and animals and everything, we're we intersect it all right there. And and people just really enjoy being with like-hearted people. So have the dates been set? Yes, October 17th through the 20th. And if you can put in the, is the chat disabled? It's the spiritualform.org slash retreat. So didn't mean to take time <laughs> to advertise that, but it is, it is a place where people who are uh, interested in health and the, the earth and veganism and spirituality, those people all are there. And so it's really just feels good to be in that space in person. Yeah. Yes, well, I was able to get that into the chat box, and this is a wonderful retreat that we do promote each year because it's uh, an annual tradition. It is, it is, and it's in the Midwest, which is kind of a different place to put our energy. I think it's really important to put our energy in the Midwest as well as the coast. So if there's no other questions, would we like to have Alyssa close out this session? Is there anything else we should be doing, Lisa? That would be fantastic. Um, let me just check a little other little questions. I think. Um, oh, so D Daniel um, shared that uh, thanks and gratitude for this inspirational meeting. So it's wonderful to have everybody here. We really appreciate you, and we are so grateful to you for your patience for some of our um, Zoom bomber issues that came up today. Uh, but we are here, and we're just delighted to be together and to to learn all about our our vision and how it connects to our our entire body and also to our spiritual self so thank you so much to um reverend carol for co-hosting and to Alyssa for sharing your wisdom with us and if you'd like to share a little closing we'd be really honored oh so thank you everyone for being here um Thank you for your presence. I felt very comfortable not knowing even that the Zoom bomber was here. Um, I didn't know either. And so I just want to um, ask you if you would like to, to close your eyes gently and sense into yourself, sense into the cells of yourself Sense into the empathy, the empathic part of the cells of yourself. Sense into the empathic part of the cells of people who are not as settled and feeling full as you are in these precious moments. Breathing deeply from the base of your feet the base of your spine, the base of your occiput, which is the back of your head where your visual processing occurs, from the base of your being, bringing in love and light and gratitude, bringing in the light of wisdom 
the light of tolerance, the light of peace. And with your next exhale, exhaling love and light and gratitude to all beings, all beings, all animals, all plants, all of life. Exhaling beauty, love, and gratitude, and then inhaling it back in, filling the inside of you with bliss, with beingness, with presence in these precious, precious moments. Allowing as much light as you are willing to allow in, to pour into you through the crown of your head, reaching into the depths of your soul, feeling your breath expand the beautiful energy as you're rooted in the earth, held by gravity, held by Father Sky and Mother Gaia. And then once again, exhaling gratitude for all of the lessons we've been given, even in this past hour, sending love and light to that Zoom bomber with his obscenities, wrapping him or her or they or them in love and light and the presence of beautiful beingness, the beautiful being that that person is, that they have yet to discover. May they be blessed. May, be, that may they discover their essence from the inside out. And with that discovery at their own pace, may they offer their love and light throughout the universe and cosmos. And so it is. Thank you so much, everybody. Beautiful. Thank you, Alyssa. That was such a nice ending to our wonderful time together. Thank you to everyone, and we hope to see you next time. Have a blessed evening. Good night, everyone. <laughs>